Everybody. My name is Dr. Sue Randall and I work in the Small Animal Internal Medicine Department at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Florida. Today I'm going to try and talk, teach you about small animal cardiology. Um, it's obviously a fairly large scope to cover in 50 minutes, so what I've decided to do is to spend most of the time talking about some of the diseases that I think are very important for you to know about, both in small animal practice, but probably more importantly for you right now for the NAVLE examination. What we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to highlight exactly what we're going to discuss during the next 50 minutes or so, and then we'll go ahead and talk about each of the things, each of the diseases. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is acquired valvular diseases in dogs and hopefully highlight the differences between endocardiosis and endocarditis. You can see that I have endocardiosis in bright yellow, and obviously that means it's a very important disease for you to know about. Then we'll move on and talk about some of the myocardial diseases. There are many cardiomyopathies that you will have heard about. The two important ones that you really need to know about right now are dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The other cardiomyopathies, which are, have many names like unclassified, intermediate, integrated cardiomyopathy, are probably beyond the scope of this talk. We're also going to talk about congestive heart failure because all of the diseases that we talk about can culminate in, in, in congestive heart failure, and it's important that you know how to manage the patients that prevent in, in heart failure. Unfortunately, the congenital cardiac defects are largely beyond the scope of this lecture, but I do have a couple of slides at the end which will summarize some of the more common ones and the, and the breeds that are predisposed to developing them. So let's move on and talk about endocardiosis. Endocardiosis is a very common disease. It essentially affects small breed, older dogs. There's one exception to this rule. Young Cavalier King Charles Spaniels are predisposed to developing this disease. So if you see a, a, a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel and it develops a murmur as young as 18 months of age, it may have and is quite likely to have endocardiosis as opposed to a congenital defect. Apart from these Spaniels, this is a disease that we see very commonly in smaller older dogs. Often they won't have any presenting complaints. You, they'll come in for a routine health exam or for vaccination and you'll pick up a murmur as part of your physical exam. If the owners aren't very good about bringing the dog in or for whatever reason you don't see the dog very often, some of the signs that they'll present with as the disease progresses are a cough which may be worse at night and may also be exacerbated with exercise, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, Exercise intolerance, so the dog that used to be able to run around the block or keep running and chasing its ball for hours suddenly decides to lay down after one block. They may have fainting episodes, which the owners might perceive as seizures. For some people, it's quite difficult to tell the difference between a syncope episode and a seizure episode. And they may present with some sort of non-specific signs of weight loss and, and reduced appetite. On your physical exam, as we said earlier, you'll detect a systolic murmur, and these can be quite loud in endocardiosis patients. The loudest is normally over the left, left side of the chest, over the, over the apex, which is over the mitral valve. Um, you'll often auscult tachycardia, and later on in the disease, you might notice that they have arrhythmias or pulse deficits, blue mucous membranes, weak pulses, and so on. And I put these pictures in just to remind you that endocardiosis is a disease that essentially affects older small breed dogs. How do we go about diagnosing it? Well, the first thing you should always do if you suspect heart disease is take some radiographs of the chest. And these are some excellent radiographs. Now, you'll note that there's a, some small white text on the picture. Don't worry if you can't read that. I'll tell you what it says. You'll notice that, in general, the heart is rather large, so you'll see generalized cardiomegaly. You'll also notice that the caudal waste has disappeared, and there's this huge extra soft tissue density over here. That is the left, uh, left atrium, and the first thing you'll see is left atrial enlargement with these guys. On the ventral dorsal view, again, there's some small white text tips you don't need to be able to read. All it says is that you have an increased 
cardiac width, all right? Normally, in a normal healthy dog, the cardiac silhouette shouldn't take up more than two-thirds of the chest on a ventrodorsal chest radiograph. You can see in this dog, it takes up considerably more than two-thirds of the chest. It's not obvious on this film, but you can also notice where, you, where, where the um, uh, mainstem bronchi divide, you'll often see what you'll see sailor's legs. So instead of the caudal bronchi, um, uh, instead of the caudal mainstem bronchi um, diverging in kind of a straight line, they'll round up a little bit. And you'll notice that that is where the left atrium is. It's right in the middle. As it enlarges, it, it buckles the mainstem bronchi. Then you're going to look for, for ECG changes. Now, there's no specific ECG changes that are associated with this particular disease. You may have heard of P mitrali, which is a widened P wave, and P pulmonary, which is a taller P wave. You may also see evidence of a wide QRS complex, which is evidence of less ventricular enlargement. Echocardiography, which is not going to be probably something you have to worry about a whole lot for your, for your exam, but this is an interesting, interesting um, Interesting, uh, this is some interesting info because you can see the exact cause of the disease here. If you look on this x-ray, this is the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right ventricle and the right atrium. I beg your pardon, I said x-ray, I meant echocardiogram. Um, this here is the mitral valve. And in a normal dog, that should be nice, thin, even leaflets. And you can see in this dog, they're all gnarled. They're all irregular and lumpy-bumpy. And what happens is, as the heart starts to contract, the blood is supposed to be pushed out into the aorta and into the peripheral circulation. But if you've got an un incompletely closed valve here, as you can see this one doesn't close completely, when the heart contracts, some blood is going to shoot back into the left atrium. And that is why you have um, left atrial enlargement associated with this disease. What do we do about endocardiosis? Remember we said earlier that a lot of these dogs are going to just present with um, signs of, well, they're not going to have any clinical signs. You're going to pick up a murmur on a physical exam, on a routine physical exam. It's been a tendency in the, amongst veterinarians, myself included, to put all these dogs onto ACE inhibitors immediately. So put them onto enalapril or bonazepril immediately. Well, a recent study out of Europe has shown that there's no difference in life expectancy um, if you put dogs on ACE inhibitors early in the disease compared to putting them on ACE inhibitors when they become symptomatic. So is it going to hurt the dog, you might ask? Well, it may. ACE inhibitors are known to cause renal damage. And remember that ACE inhibitors are not cheap. Although another pill in this country has recently been become generic, they still aren't cheap drugs. So there's no indication when dogs are asymptomatic to put them on, on the ACE inhibitors. Once they do become symptomatic, the treatment of choice is going to be an ACE inhibitor, such as enalapril, benazepril, lisinopril, some of the newer ones. Benazepril and lisinopril are slightly less nephrotoxic than some of the older drugs that we used to use. And diuretics, if they start developing signs of failure. Um, Furosemide is the standard uh, diuretic that we use in small animal practice, but there is some evidence that using it in combination with spironolactone may be beneficial um, there's some controversy as to whether to put these dogs onto digoxin or not. And I guess my feeling is, is that we should wait until they progress towards where they're more likely to be in myocardial failure before we use inotropes and digoxin. So that brings us to endocarditis. Remember we said that endocardiosis was an extremely common disease. Endocarditis is not common. And remember we said that endocardiosis occurred in small breeds and older breeds. Endocarditis normally occurs in large breed dogs. And I put this picture of the German Shepherd up here to make you un to, so you have a clear picture in your mind that large breed dogs, and particularly German Shepherds, do seem to have a predisposition to the disease. Often these dogs present without cardiovascular signs. And how does that differ from endocardiosis, you ask? Because most of those dogs don't have clinical signs either. Well, dogs that present with endocarditis normally present because they are sick. It's not just that you pick up a murmur on a routine exam. These dogs present with nebulous um, signs of illness, such as fever, arthritis, weight loss. Some of them will come in with polyuria, polydipsia, because they have um, immune complex deposition in their kidneys. So these dogs come in and they're sick, and you have to listen pretty, pretty hard in some of them to actually detect the murmur. And sometimes, depending on which velvet's on, 
that endocarditis can result in a diastolic murmur. There's another misconception among veterinarians that if you have endocardiosis and bad dental disease that's unattended, that you will develop endocarditis. That is not true. If you think about it, who gets endocardiosis? Small breed, older dogs. Who gets endocarditis? Young, large breed dogs. So the dogs that, ha dogs that have endocardiosis are not making up the bigger, biggest component of dogs that develop endocarditis. So it's not true that there is an association between dental disease and development of endocarditis from endocardiosis. That's all I'm going to say about endocarditis. We're going to move on now to some of the car cardiomyopathies. And the first one we're going to talk about is dilated cardiomyopathy. And again, I put some pictures up for you guys to show you some of the breeds that are overrepresented when we talk about cardiomyopathy. Um, there's different types of cardiomyopathy. The one that we deal with more commonly in veterinary medicine in small animals these days is primary, either idiopathic or familial. Idiopathic is by far the most common. Secondary types of cardiomyopathies are less important generally in veterinary medicine, but you still need to keep them on your list of differentials because they may still be playing a role in, in causing disease in your patients. Secondary cardiomyopathies can occur after infections. For example, you've heard of Chagas disease with Panasoma cruzi, um, parvovirus, although um, parvovirus these days, most there's enough adult dogs that are vaccinated um, that we don't even detect, we don't detect the myocardial toxicity of parvo anymore. We really, only, we really only see the gastrointestinal component of parvovirus. But when parvo first developed, young puppies would die of myocardial failure because of the way that the um, virus affected the myocardium. You can get toxicities. Those of you that go into practices um, that have uh, chemotherapy as, as one of your treatment regimens, Dr. Rubison can cause significant cardiac toxicity and can cause myocardial failure or dilated cardiomyopathy. There are some nutritional um, deficits that can cause cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, the second word there is taurine, and that is, has been blocked out by the picture of the boxer dog that is predisposed to developing cardiomyopathy. But carnitine and taurine deficiencies have been shown to cause secondary cardiomyopathy. Now, probably in the late 80s, we used to still see cats developing dilated cardiomyopathy on a reasonably frequent basis. And that was essentially due to a taurine deficiency because people were feeding their cats unbalanced cat food. Cat food. Since most of us are feeding balanced cat foods to our cats now, it's really extremely rare to see a cat with dilated cardiomyopathy. The, the breeds that you really need to be concerned about with carnitine and taurine are particularly our friend the Cocker Spaniel up here. They, a lot of these dogs have carnitine and or taurine deficiencies. And there are some evidence there's some evidence that it, that it exists in other breeds, too. Toxins and neoplasia can also result in cardiomyopathic type syndromes. Remember, this is a disease of large breed dogs, and I, I put the Doberman out here on his own on the, sec on the second page, because this is the breed by, uh, in, in which you'll see cardiomyopathy by far the most commonly. Doberman pinches and boxes. Boxes have a slightly different kind of cardiomyopathy, um, and cocker spaniels are probably the most important breeds that will be associated with cardiomyopathy. And that's important as you take your exam, because if they present you with a Doberman with a cough, there's a chance that he's going to have, a good chance that he's going to have cardiomyopathy on your exam. Because it seems to be so breed dependent, there's almost certainly a genetic component to it, and there is some work which at least suggests that it is definitely genetic in boxer dogs, um, and it's highly suspicious that it's genetic in, in Dobermans um, as well. We see it in males more commonly than in females, and it can affect dogs that are young or old. We start seeing it in younger and younger Dobermans particularly, as well as in younger boxers. Um, presenting complaint. Often these dogs have very few clinical signs until they develop congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is probably the most common presenting complaint. So these dogs have a cough, they have really short, short, short of breath and trouble breathing. They may even have some discharge from their nose or coughing up. The owners might think they're vomiting up some foamy stuff, but it's actually a cough. They have se severe exercise intolerance. They can have had fainting episodes from arrhythmias, and often they will have pretty severe weight loss. Depending on how far the, the disease has progressed, they may also have evidence of ascites and pleural effusion. On your physical exam, you may notice pale or cyanotic mucous membranes. 
you may see that they again that they have a real hard time breathing. They may have uh, really uh, rapid, really rapid heart rates with pulse deficits. Um, you may, if, it, if they have severe enough congestive heart failure, you may even be able to detect some crackles. But an important point for practice is that, that pulmonary edema has to be pretty far advanced before you can detect crackles. I've seen a dog that had almost a complete whiteout in its chest from pulmonary edema on radiograph, and yet I couldn't detect crackles. So no crackles doesn't mean no edema. These murmurs may actually be quite soft. They often do have murmurs, but they're normally they're, they're quite soft, and so you sometimes listen quite hard to detect them, particularly when a dog is really tachycardic or has some significant pulmonary congestion. It's sometimes quite difficult to pick up the murmurs, but keep listening once you've treated um, the, the congestion, and sometimes then you'll pick up the murmur. They may have an arrhythmia, they may have a gallop rhythm, they may have normal to weak pulses, they may have pulse deficits. Um, they often have severe hepatomegaly from um, backflow of blood into the, uh, into the, into the uh, abdominal organs. They may have jugular distension. And the, the, remember that if you examine them again, perhaps you have a client that brings their dogs in routinely for physical exams, and they may be absolutely normal on physical exam at initial presentation. This is a dog who had um, dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, you can see, again, he has a se severe generalized cardiomegaly. In dogs that have dilated cardiomyopathy, all of their chambers are going to dilate. All right? So they actually have, it's, we call it an eccentric hypertrophy. If you weigh the heart, it's actually heavier than it was before, even though the chambers are extremely um, dilated with very thin walls, the total mass of the heart has actually increased. And again, here you can see this severely increased size of the left atrium. This dog actually has a little bit of congestion in its lungs already, but it's not a particularly good inspiratory film because the dog was so dyspnic. It was difficult to get an inspiratory film. But I think you can get the gist of it. And again, it's got quite a globoid round heart. It looks like it takes up, and you can see there's a, a um, mediastinal shift to, to, the right, to the left side because the, the left ventricle is so enlarged. All right. This is a very chest radiographs in dogs that have dilated cardiomyopathy can be very difficult to distinguish from pericardial effusion. Okay, that both can have a really large globoid heart on X-rays, and you need to confirm the difference before you recommend treatment because the treatment is going to obviously be, be different for the two. ECGs they may be completely normal, they may just have sinus tachycardia, but I feel that the two I've included two um, arrhythmias which are common in dogs that have um, in the, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy because these may come up on your boards. This is a ventricular premature contraction. You can see it's a wide and bizarre QRS complex that is not preceded by a T wave. That's the T wave from the previous complex. Um, there's a T QRS. This is a junctional complex. You don't have to worry about that right now. And then you can see all of these beats are not preceded by T waves. They're tachycardic and they're wide and bizarre complexes. The VPCs are one of the types of arrhythmias that you're going to see with, um, with uh, a, a dilated cardiomyopathy. It's an indication of myocardial, fail, of myocardial damage. This is another very common arrhythmia that you're going to see in dogs that have dilated cardiomyopathy. Atrial fibrillation. What that is, is when you have atria that are so huge that they, and, and they're generating, um, impulses from all over in the, in the atrium, the, beat, the, the impulses cancel each other out. If you remember way back to when you, when you understood the concept of vectors in physics in high school or in college, um, the vectors will cancel each other out, and so you won't have a P wave on the e ECG, um, and the, but, but you have a really rapid, uh, normal-looking QRS complex, which means that the beat is generated higher than the AV node, but that you can't, you can't see it because the, uh, the impulses from all over the atrium, the fibrillation of the atrium is all being cancelled out. And so you have a, as I say, you have no P wave that's visible. You have fibrillation waves sometimes, and you can, uh, but you have a normal QRS complex. Okay. So remember, DCM can be associated with atrial fib and with DTCs. Again, echocardiography may, may be beyond the scope of what you need to know for the exam, but you can see that this, this is, this is the, the left ventricle over here, 
to the short axis view, and that's the right ventricle that you lose in the near field artifact. But you can see that this wall, this is a Doberman heart. That heart wall is really, really, really thin. Okay? But the left ventricle is extremely dilated. And this will look better later. I'll show you a picture of a cat with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you can see the difference in wall thickness. How do we treat DCM? Well, you're going to start to see a pattern here. ACE inhibitors, so enalapril, benalapril, um, mycinopril. Diuretics are very important because, remember, you've got that huge dilated left ventricle volume overload, and we'll talk about that again once we get on to cardiac failure. Um, but ACE inhibitors and diuretics and positive inotropes are very important to try to get um, the heart to contract a little bit stronger. And then once you start getting into significant arrhythmias, particularly um, supraventricular arrhythmias, you might want to consider using a negative chronotrope. For example, um, calcium channel blocker or beta blocker. Digoxin does have some negative chronotropic activity, and it should be your first choice of drugs. But if that does not slow the heart rate down, um, you're going to want to potentially add a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker. Um, remember your goal with treating atrial fibrillation in people, the goal is to try to convert to a normal sinus rhythm. We almost never achieve that in dogs, almost never. And so we don't aim to convert to a normal sinus rhythm. We aim to, to just slow the heart rate down so that we can improve the cardiac output. We move on to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a cat disease. It is very, very, very uncommon in dogs. I've seen it in one dog um, in my, during my career. It is something that is fairly um, prominent in cats. You do see it more often. Again, males seem to be more affected than females. The average age that they start to be affected is around 7 years, although the range is from 18 months right up until 15 or 16 years. Now, that's an important concept to grasp because Sometimes you're going to have cats that develop heart murmurs, and the things that you worry about, the, the big three, I call them the big three H's in cats, are, that cause murmurs are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertension, and hypothyroidism. Well, both of the other two, hypothyroidism and hypertension, on average affect older cats. So if you see a young animal, the chances are it's probably got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy rather than one of the other two. Maine Coons, American British Shorthair Cats, Ragdolls, Norwegian Forest Cats, and Persians seem to be overrepresented. And there's actually been one family of Maine Coon Cats where it's actually been shown to be a familial disease. And therefore, again, this, part, this disease probably does have a genetic component to it. It hasn't yet been completely elucidated. Picture of a Maine Coon kitty over here. Just so that you remember that it can occur in young cats. This is one of the cats that's predisposed to it. And this is particularly one of the breeds that you can see it in younger animals. Often with cats, the most common sign is that they're going to have shortness of breath, all right? And this is something that you see with minimal, minimal um, stress. These cats will develop severe difficulties with breathing. Some of them will have syncope. Some of them will have um, acute, uh, acute paraplegia episodes or paraparesis due to somber embolism. Um, they may just have nonspecific signs of weight loss, anorexia, vomiting. Um, remember that in cats, coughing is a sign of heart disease. It's extremely uncommon. So, whereas in dogs, it's one of the most common signs, coughing is extremely uncommon in cats that have heart disease. What will we find in your physical exam? Well, you might find a rapid heart rate again. Um, you, you, you probably will hear a murmur, but you're going to have to listen in a slightly different place to where you hear most dog murmurs. You're going to listen right over the sternum. And it's going to probably be, it might just be to the left or just to the right, depending on the heart shape and size. And it may, and it, it may be over the left apex. But my experience tells me that most commonly I hear cat murmurs right over the sternum. Um, you may hear a galloping so gallop sound if they get tachycardic enough. Um, and sometimes they'll be, as I said before, with minimal, minimal stress, these cats will go into severe respiratory distress. Um, that should be your key that they may have heart disease. Chest radiographs, the important thing in cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if you think with dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy, they have an eccentric, uh, eccentric um, hypertrophy, and so the chambers dilate, so the whole heart dilates, and so on x-ray, the whole heart may look bigger. If you think on cats, they have a concentric hypertrophy. In other words, 
the heart is laying down layers of more and more muscle on the inside of the heart, and so often these texts look completely, completely normal on chest X-ray. They may not. They may look like this kitty, who has pretty significant um, pulmonary edema. You can see he's got an interstitial and alveolar pattern. You may not be able to see this particularly clearly, but he does have an alveolar pattern. And the reason I show you this kitty, again, you can see it, his heart is really difficult to see on the VD, probably because he has um, some pleural effusion and some pulmonary edema as well. The reason I wanted to show you a cat and heart failure is cats and heart failure don't follow necessarily the typical perihilar edema pattern that dogs show. They can get patchy edema all throughout their chest. And you can see this particular kitty has edema kind of called uh, a ventra, ventra, ventracranially as opposed to just all around the perihilar region. Here he just has a severely increased interstitial pattern. Most of these ECGs in cats are going to be normal or just have a sinus tachycardia. You can see a less, an occasional arrhythmia. And the reason I put this x-ray in is because this is a classic arrhythmia that we see in cats with, um, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it's not common. And this, this particular ECG is actually from a dog. And the reason I put it in is because it's a lot easier from your distance to be able to see this. It's a left bundle branch. And you can see this cat has some really huge... QRS complexes, um, much wider than 0.04 seconds, um, and that's very classic for cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is the echocardiogram I was telling you about. You can cast your mind back to the, do the, do the Doberman that we showed you earlier that had severe eccentric hypertrophy. Now, that was a Doberman. This is a cat. Look at the difference in the wall size. This is phenomenally thick. This is probably two or three times the thickness of the wall that the, cat, that the Doberman had. Okay? And you can see the size of the lumen is minuscule in comparison to that, the Doberman in the, in the previous echo image. So these papillary muscles are particularly huge. This is another view. This is a view that uh, you don't have to understand the exact view that this is, but if, let me tell you this. This is the aorta. And this is the left atrium. And by convention, this is the view that we use to measure the left atrial size. And if I tell you that the left atrium should be about the same diameter as the aorta, the level of the aortic valve, which this, this is the way the valve leaflets, you can see that this is phenomenally enlarged compared to the, the aorta. And this is dangerous because this is where we get clots in cats, from the embolism in cats that have um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They get turbulent blood flow, this big flaccid atrium that's hanging around, and the, the blood flow kind of forms a clot in there, and that, that's where these thromboemboli come from. Remember we said earlier that your differential for cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is going to be a T, it's going to be hypothyroidism and blood pressure and, and hypertension. So when you have a cat that presents with these signs, it's always a good idea to measure a T4 and a blood pressure in these cats. Remember, however, that some animals may have, an, have a normal thyroid and, but still, or appear to be, have a normal thyroid or appear to even have a low thyroid because they're sick from other diseases. And that's the euthyroid sick syndrome. How do we treat these kitties? Well, what we're trying to do is cats with have, that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, their big problem is they can't relax their heart. So they don't have enough flow of blood into that ventricle before it contracts again. So they have a reduced cardiac output because they have a reduced stroke volume. So what we're trying to do is slow the heart rate down to the point where um, the, so, so the, heart, the heart can fill up properly before it contracts again. If you cast your mind back to physics again, to Starling's forces, the far, farther you stretch, the more it's going to rebound when it contracts. So what we're trying to do is using propanolol, atenolol, or diltiazem, is we're trying to slow the heart rate down, so it increases diastolic filling. Okay. For cats that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we only use diuretics and nitroglycerin if they're in congestive heart failure. We very seldom use them in conventional management of the disease. Another thing, for example, the cat that we saw, saw in that echo with that phenomenally huge left atrium might benefit from some low-dose aspirin therapy. For example, one baby aspirin every 72 hours or so it may prevent it from developing from the embolism. We're going to move on now and talk a bit about heart failure. 
Remember that heart disease is not the same as heart failure. There's all sorts of definitions for heart failure out there, but this is the one that I like. Heart failure is a clinical syndrome caused by heart disease that results in systolic and or diastolic dysfunction severe enough to overwhelm the cardiovascular system's compensatory mechanisms. So, for example, if I give you, you any one of you, I give you a fluid bolus and I give you a huge volume overload, your body has compensatory mechanisms that are con going to prevent you from going into congestive heart failure. All right? So you will just end up peeing out that excess fluid. But if you have some heart disease and I give you a huge bolus of IV fluids, your compensatory mechanisms are probably going to be overwhelmed and you're going to go into congestive heart failure. All right. So there's different types of heart failure that we deal with in veterinary medicine, systolic and diastolic. Systolic failure, you're going to think about your myocardial failures, which are essentially going to be your dilated cardiomyopathies. And then you're going to think about increased cardiac workloads, so volume overloads, pressure overloads, and then arrhythmias can also result in heart failure. For example, if you have a sustained tachycardia, um, you are eventually going to tire out your myocardium and go into congestive heart failure. Or if you have a sustained atrioventricular block, the same thing is going to happen. You're going to have a profound volume overload and you're going to go into heart failure. Cats, we mainly are dealing with diastolic failure because we have decreased ventricular compliance. So, in other words, the ventricle can't stretch out enough and squeeze, squeeze, and then and then squeeze back to eject blood out into the into the circulation. How do all of these things cause heart failure? Well, myocardial failure. This is pretty simple. You get reduced contraction because the myocardium is not working very well. Therefore, you have reduced stroke volume, and therefore blood backs up in the venous system. Let me show you a diagram here. This is a normal heart. In this image, you can see. This heart is able to contract normally, so blood that comes from the left atrium is able to be ejected out into the aorta nicely. This heart is a dog, belongs to a dog that has dilated cardiomyopathy, so he's got myocardial damage. He can't contract his heart muscle. So when a heart tries to contract, it's got a huge overload to the right, to the left, the left ventricle, and when he tries to contract, he can't contract very well, so a, a tiny amount of blood goes shooting out into the aorta. But the heart's still got this huge amount of blood resting in the in the ventricle. So what does it do? Well, if it's got this increased volume, it stretches out the valves between the atrium and, and the ventricle. The valves can't close, and the blood's got to go somewhere, so the blood rushes back into the left atrium. And this is why we see dogs that have myocardial failure developing left atrial enlargement, because they can't contract, so the blood pulls up in the ventricle, the ventricle, the, the valves can't close properly between the atrium and the ventricle, so blood goes back up into the left atrium. So we talk about volume overload. So you have an excessive ventricular volume, and therefore you get eccentric hypertrophy. But remember we talked about the heart wall may look thin, but the actual total heart rate is increased. So it, it, it actually is hypertrophy, even though it looks thin. Diseases that can cause this are things that cause reduced cardiac output, so endocardiosis, endocarditis, congenital defects like pulmon, um, patent ductus arteriosus, ASDs, VSDs. They result in a significant increase in the volume that goes to the left ventricle. And then there are metabolic conditions like anemia and hypothyroidism that can do it. Again, we look at our, at our uh, normal heart here. We have a normal volume of blood going in and normal squeeze, and it normally goes... Oh, Sorry, goes out into the into the circulation. This heart, we have an increased amount of blood coming back into the heart, into the left atrium. So when the heart squeezes, it sends its normal amount out into the peripheral circulation. If you have endocardiosis, the blood's going to shoot back into the left atrium. If you have a congenital anomaly, remember again, you get a volume overload, and so the valve isn't going to be able to close properly, and it's going to go back into the left atrium. So again, you're going to see a very similar picture to what you saw in myocardial failure. You're going to have a dog that has a huge left atrium and a thin, flaccid um, left ventricular wall and a volume overload in the left ventricle. All right, let me talk about pressure overloads. Um, this is where you've got a resistance to ventricular ejection, and you get concentric hypertrophy. So if you think about um, if you had, say, the, the, the doorway to your classroom, um, it's a double doorway, and so three people can fit through at a time. So every time the classroom contracts, three of you can escape at a time. 
But if we only open one door, for example, which is the equivalent to, say, having pulmonic stenosis, the heart contracts, but only one of you, or the classroom contracts, but only one of you can get out at a time. So only one, only a small amount of blood can get out at a time. But the heart's got to somehow get rid of that blood, or the classroom somehow got to get rid of students, and so it's going to try and do it even harder. So what it does in response to that is it thickens up, so it can try and contract even more forcefully. And the things that we see this with are, like we said, valvular stenosis, and again with hypertension. So if, it's con if you've got hypertension in the periphery, your left ventricle trying to contract against it, it it's going to have to get thicker to try and send the same amount of blood into the periphery. The same with pulmonary hypertension. So if you have a dog that has heartworm disease and has pulmonary hypertension, secondary to heartworms, um, you might see some ventricular wall thickening, so concentric hypertrophy. So again, here's our normal heart. You get some normal blood coming into the left atrium, going down into the ventricle, and shooting out into the aorta. You don't, you don't have to be able to read these labels. Um, compared to if you have a valvular stenosis here, the wall is going to thicken in order to try and get the same amount of blood into the uh, circulation. And remember, there's only a certain amount that the heart... And so reduced stroke volume goes out into the circulation and therefore you have a reduced cardiac output. Here's the normal heart. Normal heart can relax in diastole and the blood can pour down from the atrium into the ventricle and fill. So the ventricle, when it does contract, a nice large amount of blood gets sent out into the periphery. You have a heart that has, really, has, has a, a severe thickening, less of the normal amount of blood can get into the, get, even it gets into the ventricle because it can't fill um, and some, so a reduced amount goes out into circulation but you also have the blood that can't get into the um, ventricle that stays in the atrium and, cause, and causes atrial um, enlargement. So what is heart failure? Pretty much most of them are caused by a decrease in stroke volume and this results in a decrease in arterial blood pressure. And these are a couple of little formulae that you might have to remember. This is an important one. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. And blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times... To, um, uh, so if you drop the stroke volume, you can see that blood pressure would therefore be heart rate times stroke volume times total peripheral resistance. Um, but if you drop your stroke volume, your blood pressure is indirectly going to drop. And that, that's a bad thing, because then your peripheral organs are not confused. So what happens when your blood pressure drops? Well, remember you have baroreceptors. You have your carotid body and there's some other baroreceptors. And they note that the peripheral blood pressures drop. So they start calling in, calling in the soldiers, all right? They activate, the first thing they do is activate the sympathetic nervous system, okay? Um, they call the marines in. So what, what happens when the marines come in? Well, you get arteriolar constriction, you get an increased heart rate, you get increased contractility, and therefore you improve your cardiac output. But the marines can only work, or the, the, the um, so sympathetic nervous system can only work for a certain amount of time. They're used to good, but they're used to working in intense situations, but they don't have much stamina. And so after 72 hours, the beta receptors start to downregulate. Okay. Um, and so if you don't have other compensatory mechanisms, kind of long-term compensatory mechanisms, that's when you're going to go into heart failure. But the body's okay because we have some other, we have some other reserves too. We call in the reserves after the Marines have got tired, okay? What are we going to do? So stroke volume is equal to, and this is probably not that important, but stroke volume is equal to end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So if we increase the stroke, the end diastolic volume, we can increase, um, the, the stroke volume. Okay, so remember how we do this. We get eccentric hypertrophy, right? So we increase the, we're trying to increase the end diastolic volume. So that's why those hearts get bigger and the walls get thinner, but they're still bigger. And then we got the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and that will 
increase that will increase the amount of water that's kept in to try and improve increase the amount of fluid that is um, emptied into the left ventricle to be sent out to the periphery. But remember, this eccentric hypertrophy can only go on so long. So eventually, it's, it's got to as big as you can. But the renin L and the endotensin aldosterone system keeps going, and so you've got you, you keep trying to pour more and more fluid into the system, into this this um, chamber that's got as big as it possibly can get. And what's going to happen if you keep adding more water? Well, it's going to back up somewhere. Backs up in the blood vessels. What happens when it backs up in the blood vessels? The blood vessels say, "Hey, we can't take any more." Hydrostatic pressure is getting too high in here, and so some of the water jumps out of the vessel, jumps out of the board, and goes into the into the into the, the tissues. So this is why we see pulmonary edema, why we see pleural effusion, and so on. You get fluid into the, entering into the tissues to try and offload some of the increased hydrostatic pressure. Clinical signs that we see with congestive or backward failure, we see congestion and edema. So. That's probably the most common sign we see, but we do sometimes see low output failure. We see um, inadequate blood flow. And the end stage of congestive or, or both forward and backward heart failure is we see cardiogenic shock. And unfortunately, by the time animals go into cardiogenic shock, they have severely decreased blood flow and blood pressure, and it's almost always an irreversible um, condition. So when the blood pressures are really, really through the floor, and you, no matter what you do, you can't get these animals around. So what do we have to worry about in heart failure? How do we know how to treat heart failure? Well, the human um, medical people have done a great job for us. They've classified heart failure because we like to classify diseases. And there's four classes of heart failure. Class one is when you have heart disease but no obvious clinical evidence of heart failure. Class two is when you have slight exercise intolerance. Um, you may have slight exercise, I mean, uh, shortness of breath, and you probably will fatigue a little bit more than you used to. Um, so this is the dachshund that used to go running for miles, or the Jack Russell that used to run for miles, and now after, you know, he can only run for half an hour now, and then he starts to get tired, or he has shortness of breath. Um, then we have class three, and this is moderate exercise intolerance. So these dogs get really short of breath with minimal exercise. This is the little poodle that used to go for a two-mile walk with the owner every day, and now walks down the steps at the front, you know, walks, walks up down the steps, walks, out, walks down one block and, and sits down and can't go on. Class four is when, even at rest, these dogs are, so this is the dog that comes into your clinic in the owner's arms because it can't walk, all right? It's, it's, and it's gasping for breath and it's cyanotic and it, can't, it cannot move anywhere because it, it, it's, in, it's in really bad, bad shape. What do they have to do? Class one heart failure, often they don't need any significant treatment alterations. Then you just treat them as you would, as we've already mentioned, under the particular diseases for cardiomyopathy, um, endocardiosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. No specific, no worsening treatment, no more severe treatment is needed. Class two, it is definitely time to start adding in some more, some more, um, more drugs. Think about adding in some furosemide, potentially an ACE inhibitor. This is the time when you start sodium restricting their diet. So, um, I'm not sure it's essential that you put them on HD because most dogs aren't going to like a really totally salt restricted diet at this point. But perhaps if you're giving them snacks, you don't want to give them, you know, gravy and so on. Give them low salt snacks. Remember that arsenal reducers and uh, preload reducers and arsenal reducers um, are needed, and ACE inhibitors are both preload and arsenal reducers. So this is something you can just use one drug to 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 do both. This is a class where you can use just one drug, and it, it accomplishes both preload and arsenal reduction. Class three is where you're going to start considering um, increasing your doses of furosemide. So you might have a dog that when he was in class two might have been on a low dose of furosemide twice a day, might have been on an ACE inhibitor once a day. You really do, in these dogs, want to start, incre when they, once they start getting into class three, you may have to increase the furosemide to three times a day. Um, you might have to put the ACE inhibitor up to the maximum dose twice a day and so on. And you can probably to start considering adding a, adding a, a positive inotrope and you may need to use a negative inotrope. And probably at this point wouldn't go beyond doing digoxin. Remember we talked earlier about being able to use beta blockers and calcium channel blockers as well. But at this point, you probably just need, can get away with just using digoxin. Um, 
again, class three, you might want to increase the dose and dosing frequency. We've talked, we've actually talked about this. We had a double slide there. Um, and sometimes these dogs, once they're in class three, you may actually need to do periodic thoracosynthesis and abdominosynthesis. We have a little whippet that comes into our clinic probably every two or three weeks now, and he's been coming for almost a year. He goes fine, but he fills up with fluid every now and then. And so every three weeks or so, we, we drain a couple of liters of fluid off his belly, and Thomas goes out the door again, and we don't see him for three weeks, and he has three good weeks. Um, so, you know, the, 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 this is when you might have to start doing these kinds of more advanced treatment measures. Class four dogs are dogs that are going to be in your hospital, and you need to treat them aggressively. For and I, we talked about in, in, in from class one to class three, we often use them um, once or twice, sometimes three times a day, and we normally use them at fairly low doses, two to four megs per kick. Well, when they have fulminant congestive heart failure in their chest, you can barely see um, their heart because the chest is so full of fluid. You might have to increase the furosemide to every one or two hours, and you can go as high as six milligrams per kilogram. And this is when you start using afterload reducers. We've got nitroprusside and nitroglycerine. Um, ACE inhibitors, starting an ACE inhibitor at this point, most of the ACE inhibitors we have are oral drugs, and they're not going to have effect. They're not going to have an effect quickly enough for what you need for the, uh, the critical acute nature of class four heart failure. You should start the dogs on ACE inhibitors and digoxin and so on, but for your more immediate effect, you're going to probably need to use um, a nitrogen drug like nitroprusside or nitroglycerin. Um, you might also use dobutamine as an inotrope. There have been some sh studies that have shown that dobutamine um, for 72 hours really does improve the cardiac output considerably, and this gives the dog a, brain, a, a break in order to try and overcome the severe heart failure. Um, oxygen therapy is also warranted. When they really have a chest full of fluid, you really do need to supplement them with 40% oxygen. And again, thoracosynthesis and abdominosynthesis is necessary. It's very important to, to try and keep these dogs as comfortable as possible. I'm going to talk, um, like we said, we don't really have time in the scope of this lecture to talk about congenital heart diseases. But this is my advice to everybody, because I've been out in practice, I know what it's like. If you have a puppy or a kitten and it comes into your practice for a puppy series of vaccinations and you pick up a murma, it's fine, wait a month till you next see it. If that murma is still there but it hasn't gone away, this is my advice. Refer it to somebody who can do a more advanced cardiac workup because there are a lot of these cardiac, a lot of the congenital defects are, some of them are curable now and some of them are not curable but are manageable. And it's my opinion that it's probably mal verging on malpractice not to at least offer referral of these patients, okay? There's a lot of your clients that are going to say, hey, we'll, we'll let the dog live as long as it lives, and then we'll, we find we'll let it go, we're at peace with that, but you should at least offer them the option of referral because they may want to take it a bit further. So I've made a couple of tables here of the, the uh, uh, common congenital defects and the breeds that are predisposed to them. And this is probably all you really need to know for the scope of this, this lecture. Um, the most, and, and the other thing you'll notice is I've put the, ta the tables are in order of, of most common, of, of commonness of the diseases, okay? So PDA is by far the most common congenital anomaly. And that's important because guess what? It's fixable. So if you notice the, P if you notice the congenital murmur and it's a pansystolic murmur, you want to refer that dog because it's fixable. I have a PDA puppy. Um, Mainly small breed dogs, but again, shepherds, rottweilers, um, and English spring and spaniels are probably the biggest dogs that have occurred. And subaortic stenosis, again, it's a breed that is more, co it's a disease that's more common in large breed dogs, such as golden retrievers, rottweilers, boxers, newfies. Okay. Notice rottweilers come up a lot in these congenital defects. Um, pulmonic stenosis, English bulldogs, mastiffs, samoyeds, kirschhants, Miniature schnauzers as West Highland White Terriers, American Cocker Spaniels. Remember, English Bulldogs have a slightly different pulmonic stenosis than a lot of the other breeds. They have an aberrant band of their coronary artery, and so they may be more difficult to treat than some of the others. But pulmonic stenosis is a treatable disease. Ventricular septal defects, English Springer Spaniels are, are predisposed to them. These ones are, are those are the, the big four um, diseases. These ones are the next in order of in, in order of um, most likely or common, most common, and Tetralogy of Philo, there's some new, there's some new um, work going on in trying to fix these guys, and there's 
some convincing evidence that, it, that fixing them surgically may be a benefit. Mitral dysplasia, again, there's our Rottweiler friends and large breed dogs. Cuspid dysplasia, very common, well, not very common, but it's fairly common in Labrador retrievers and, again, in large breeds. Persistent right aortic arch, another one that, that is completely fixable, all right? Remember, dogs that have PRAA often don't present with signs of cardiovascular disease. They're going to present with signs of um, regurgitation. When you start to wean them, they're going to regurgitate. So that's probably the most important thing I can tell you about congenital defects. And hopefully I've covered all of the important parts of cardiology for small animals in this 50 minutes. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys at the question and answer session on the 14th of February. And if anyone has any questions at that time, I'd be happy to answer them. And if I can be of any more help, hopefully you'll let me know how at the, on the 14th of February. Thank you.